into kick drum creation. Now, I did one of those these masterclasses last week in London for London Music Conference, and we're going to be putting that masterclass out fully screen captured soon. So we did something similar, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way using some different tools. So it's not as if this is going to be like a, a repeat of what we looked at last weekend. This is going to be very different stuff. So I'm going to go into a couple of different areas of, of what I would typically do and incorporating a few tools. So we're going to start off with kick drums and I'm going to use two major tools. Uh, if you watch the London Music Conference uh, masterclass, what you'll see is I, I tend to use the drum synth quite a lot in Machine. So moving away from Machine towards another couple of great tools for constructing kick drums from scratch, I'm going to use Reactor 6 using the fairly recent Track 1, which I'm a very big fan of. And it's incredible what you can get through with kick and bass using this new, or fairly new within the last few months, new module that Native have come out with. And I have to say it is absolutely fantastic. And you can easily construct kick drums that sound great from scratch. And then I've got the obvious one, which is kick two. But I'm going to take you through how I've made a particular kick drum right the way through from the initial kind of sub phase, which is not too different from the default, but particularly going into clicks. And then having a bit of a discussion about bass as well, because the track one, you'll probably have seen, if I just bring that back up, that it can do both kick and bass. So you can use this as two entirely separate modules. And you'll get an understanding of how you can actually use both modules to create a really solid low end in your track and get complete and total control from scratch. So you can start to develop a bit of a signature sound for yourself. Then moving on with the bass as well, I'm going to go into some basic FM just to show some basic techniques around how you could make this kind of like, you know, classic sort of FM techno bass sound. Uh, we're going to look at actually layering vocal stabs and vocal shots over kicks as well, which is quite a cool thing. And then ultimately having a bit of a discussion about resampling. Because one of the major things that I do see when I work with clients or I see people's productions it, and, and talk to people about workflow because what I do apart from be a production artist and an engineer in my own right working with the likes of Sasha and, and many other artists, I, I help people with their workflows and I consistently see people trying to do a lot of processes at the same time. So say for example, within the context of a track, there is a lot of sound design and composition and arrangements all happening at once. So it's a bit of a problem because it creates a confusion of process and it means that we end up not doing any of these things well. So what we'll look at now is effectively what we're looking at right now in this Ableton session is actually what I would default call one of my sound design sessions. I do all of my sound design outside of the writing process. I tend to do it in a completely boxed off separate way. I'll have a session in my diary every week that I will dedicate to nothing but actually making sounds. I often call it having a competition with myself to make the weirdest noise, but that's enough about my private life. So in terms of, of moving on here, we'll start off with track one. And track one is, is a fantastic tool. And I've been playing around with this for a little bit of a while now. And as you'll hear straight away, if I just solo this, you know, it's got a pretty damn good sound. So just to talk you through the, the major sort of, um, the major sort of interface here, we've got a, a kick module and a bass module. And then on top of that, you've got various effects that will come into it. And it's great because if you look at the kick module here, you've got two layers. A layer A, layer B. So you can use a combination of different things here. You can use synth. And also as well, you've got various samples that sound great. You can also layer white noise or shape noise and a rumble as well, which is kind of like a, an abstract kind of reverb type sound. And you've got so much control. So first of all, what I'll do is I'll just play a kick that I've built and then I'll talk about how I've play, played around with it. So, you know, pretty fat. 
And you can hear there's like delays and reverbs going off and stuff like that as well. Because again, I'm going for that sort of classic kick with like the reverb rumble in there as well. And that's something that track one is very, very capable of doing. So within layer A here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn layer B, B off for now. And we're just going to deconstruct this kick without any, any effects. So what you'll hear initially is just this synthesized thing. And again, I've got a low pass filter on here so I can roll that all the way up if necessary and I can shape it whichever way I want. Now, the thing that I love the most about track one is that the filters are tremendously accurate. They're very, very smooth and you can really, really get a sweet spot very, very quickly. It's the accuracy of the tools that really stand out to me. I find when you use more sort of standardized tools, like say for example, Ableton's included filters or EQs for example, or distortions, they tend to be a little bit heavy handed or a little bit kind of vague in terms of their control. And you can tell that Native have put a lot of work into actually making sure that these tools are very accurate for the job at hand. So what I've done here on the global tune is I've just knocked the, the root note down by three semitones. So that means both layers will come down by three semitones. And again, a very small but very simple, very effective mixer control, which means I'm offsetting slightly more volume in layer A than I am on B. So to talk about the synth here, if I just sort of give you a, an idea of, of where you can go with the various... Um, modulation opportunities here. If I, you can see that rolls down to almost like just a, a, a triangle wave almost. And then with a little more boost here, you can see I'm really changing the overall scope of the wave. Now, in terms of changing things like the duration, I can make the kick longer, I can give it less decay, I can make it more cut or more of a longer sound. And then also as well, I can change the actual shape of the wave. If I was to set this all the way to zero, as you can see, it can be a very, very simple sine wave, which means you can get into doing things like 808, 909 type kicks. Because if we actually deconstruct what a, a kick actually is, it's just a, a pitched sine wave or a pitched wave. Very, very violent, very quick pitch modulation. And again, you can go from, again, with the bend, Excuse me, can I get more volume, please? No, not possible. You can't? Dude, it's really quiet in the room. Right, anyway. I'll turn it up. Right. So, as you can hear, that's just a really nice underpin. And I can add more drive if necessary. And again, you can get more into, you know a harder techno kick with a bit more drive. And then in terms of adding on a layer on top of that, if I was to switch over, I can move over into layer B, where I've actually got a sample, which again, very simple, if I was to roll off the whole thing, right the way down, because again, I'm using a, a high pass filter here, because I'm looking to use it just for the more sort of top end kind of click. What you've actually got in the, the sample areas here is that you've got various different types of sample. So you can see here, I've got analog and it's sample number nine within that category. You've got analog, digital, acoustic, subs, actual acoustic drums, effects type stuff where it's like claps and you know interesting noises, and also user as well. So you can use Reactor's interface to load your own samples in, which is quite cool as well. But to be honest, the the samples within track one are absolutely fantastic and you can get a great sound very, very quickly. Again, adding some drive and a bit of resonance and literally it's just a case of playing the two layers together until you get something that fits. So you can hear both of them together, there's a slight clash frequency wise. You can hear the two of them kind of coming together. Whereas if I roll up, you can hear the kick getting a little bit cleaner if I'm around that sort of 8 to 10k range. So, if you listen to a lot of like major techno productions, 
sometimes you, you think there's actually a lot more going on than there actually is because it's layered with like again reverb and rumble and various other things but the kicks are actually quite clean at the first sort of port of call it's then how you process it after the fact so then that's where i can start bringing in uh, delay and then reverb in order to create these rumbles now track one what i would do here i would maybe look towards uh using maybe a separate module and maybe a separate reverb to create the rumble and then resample it but just to give you an idea of what i can do here between the two which you've just heard already and again you can hear like if i just put the delay on itself the delay time is actually on three eighths so it gives this nice little run and again it's to give an extra little groove about 29% feedback dampen things quite low so you don't get too much mid-range in the actual the actual final kick and again adding a reverb and what's quite interesting here is that this is actually a reverse reverb so traditionally what you would do to get that kind of rumble is that you would quite heavily sidechain using maybe LFO tool sidechain compression Nicky Romero kickstart those types of tools or something that I'm going to show you shortly that I've built myself using Max for Live plugins so you can get a nice little equivalent for, you know, low to no cost if you've, if you've got like Live 10 Suite. You can actually use them to create this kind of like reverse, kind of like shifted reverb, which is very, very popular in a lot of techno productions. And again, you've got various different styles of reverb. And the reverse one is actually quite an interesting addition because it's almost a nod towards this type of style within techno. So it's quite a cool thing. So yeah, I mean, what's great about it is it's incredibly quick to get some really, really great sounds. Now, if we go into the effects here, what you'll see as well is that I've got drive over the whole kick. And I can use different types of distortion. I've got... Uh, bit crush, I've got sample and hold, distortion, things like that. And then obviously I can use an equalizer just to provide a little bit more bump in the low end at a real nice resonant frequency, which is at 32 here. Again, I can find that resonant peak. Normally we're talking about anything from around about, you know, 30 to like 55, 60 hertz in that range, depending upon your root note. And again, adding a little bit more click by just adding a little bit of EQ at the top. Now, all of this is deeply technical stuff. This is all the type of thing that you'll be wanting to think of, again, outside of actually writing a track. You may have noticed all of the discussion so far is on root notes and waves and the more audio engineering style of making music. This is not so much a discussion about what do I want my track to say? What kind of message do I want it to have? What's the emotional feel? what kind of effect or impact am I trying to have on the dance floor, which is the major focus of you in your writing and arrangement process. So this is why I always do these types of sessions separately from my writing process, because they're not only incompatible thought processes, they're actually competitive with one another. And one of the things that I do really try and promote is the idea that multitasking doesn't exist. It's bullshit. It's a complete myth. The word itself was only invented in the 1960s. And actually, it's been shown scientifically that humans cannot do more than one thing at once. So the next time your partner criticizes you for not multitasking, then you can just say, but it's science. It just it can't happen, you know? You can refer to you. Yeah, you can send them in my direction, yeah? <laughs> That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with your personal hell. That's not a problem. That's what I'm here for. And I'll send you an invoice afterwards. So, so in, terms of, in terms of, again, separating process in a way that makes sense, which means that you can focus fully on this process, and it means that you get the best out of this process. It gets rendered into one kick drum that sounds fantastic in your tracks, and then it becomes a tool within your productions. It's not something that you then have to constantly manage through the production. And I, I see artists struggle with this stuff all the time, where you know you open up an artist's Ableton session or a Logic session or whatever DAW they use, Bitwig, whatever, because I work in them all, 
and you can see like three or four kick layers and there's like automation going off everywhere and then sort of halfway through people's writing processes like their kick starts to change for no apparent reason and there's like fucking just lines everywhere and it's like dude do that stuff before you write because you're trying to like do everything at once you're trying to juggle 15 balls in the air when you only really need to have like one thing that you do so it kind of makes sense right and the nice thing is once you've resampled yourself and you've created an audio file of this then you can put that into a library of customized sounds which means then that becomes your kick drum I mean, I've spoken to a lot of artists in, in, in my time, especially recently, and a couple of them, great friends of mine, uh, Patrice Baumel and uh, Sebastian Ledger. And the funny thing is, Sebastian Ledger told me I was recently DJing with him uh, in Asia, and he basically said, yeah, I've used one kick drum in my whole career. <laughs> and he's one of the most like revered producers of the last 20 years, and he's used one kick drum in every record, and nobody's noticed yet, <laughs> you know? Because that's the other big thing, right? A lot of artists, they tend to, especially when you're developing and you're trying to develop a sound or develop your skills, people tend to put pressure on themselves to like completely reinvent the wheel every time. Like, I've got to use a different kick drum every time, you know, and I've got to do this. And it's like, well, how do people recognize it's you if you're using completely different sounds every time? It's fine. In fact, it is a good idea to recycle sounds and use them over several productions because metaphorically speaking, when the needle hits the record, that's how you know a Sebastian Ledger record is a Sebastian Ledger record. That's how you instantly know it's Patrice Balmo. And that's what you want. You want, as an artist, to develop your own sound. You want someone to be able to hear that first kick drum and go, ah, it's that guy or girl. Ah, it's that person. Ah, it's that artist. Fantastic. Like, you instantly know. So how do you do that other than developing sounds like this in a safe environment where... You're not going to destroy a, a great track by trying to make a kick drum halfway through your, your writing process. But you're basically doing this in this nice little, what I call the sandbox, where you can play, you can experiment wildly, you can go crazy, and you can just try stuff. And again, it's all down to expectation as well, where if you have a, an expectation of going into a sound design session, and all you try and do and achieve is to make one kick drum that sounds good, then congratulations, you've made one kick drum that sounds good. The session is a success. You don't have to beat yourself up anymore. You know, it's about keeping things light. It's about keeping things fun and experimenting. I don't think enough producers do this. I think we're too enslaved to presets and we're too enslaved to trying to get to a certain sound or trying to sound like somebody else. When if we all, all took a little bit more time out to sit and to just figure out what actually works for us, then we'd all be having a lot more fun and we'd be taking a lot of pressure off ourselves and we'd probably be writing the music that we're meant to write. So the next stage of the process here is again resampling. So I would take that as a, as a, a dry kick. So I'm going to take the reverb and effects off here. And for those of you maybe you're not too sure about Ableton here, I always have a resampling track. I have it in my sound design sessions particularly. I'll even have one just put to one side even in my production sessions. If I feel inspired to resample certain parts within my own tracks and then be able to say print a reverb, return, or a sound source so I can then further manipulate and layer it as part of maybe further in the production. It's a really, really useful tool. One of the things that I'll have here, have the audio from on the IO set to resample. And if you guys haven't used this before, it's a real, real great tool. Anything that's soloed or anything that's coming through the master channel within Ableton will be received at the resampling input, which means if I set the monitor to in and record on. And if I hit here, what we're going to get is the kick coming through as we hear it. So I'll maybe like record eight bars of that. And now I've got that kick as an eight bar loop, which then I can take on into my productions. Or, even though I've got 
a pattern here because we've got a step sequencer in here, which is really nice and really intuitive. I could basically just right click on each one and have one kick, record that in over one bar and have it as an isolated kick, which then would go into my chosen tool, which is a drum rack, which is something I use quite a lot with Ableton, which a lot of people have seen me use over the years. So in order to make sure that I'm, I'm on the right track, I'll also have like some basic samples that I might use in a techno production, for example, in a little drum rack that will show me exactly whether or not I'm on the right track and I'm kind of blending things into the right area. So if I was to just play this, and it's just a basic kind of thing, and if I just, you know, I mean, great, we're off to the races, so to speak. And then from there, we can kind of move more onto a, a different style of kick using kick two. So what I'm gonna do is this kick comes out slightly different and there's a couple of little techniques here that I wanna go through. So if I just play that as a clip. And there's a few different things going on here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna solo each layer. So you have like the, the initial sub, which I've kind of tuned and worked with. And then there's three different clicks. This is one of the things I love about Kick2, is I have three different click modules where I can use them for different types of tones. And one of my favorite things to do is actually very subtly place vocals on top of kicks. Just to give a little bit of interest, a little tone, a little breath, almost. So if we were to look at this first initial module, I'm just going to turn this up so we can hear it. Like you wouldn't think that was in the kick because it's blended. But if I was to just drop this down a little bit and play it just with the sub. Okay. And it just gives this little color, this little bit of extra, something extra that if it was missing, you would actually miss it. That's the key thing. That's a, a useful tip, actually, that when you do something like this or you layer something, or even if you add a new layer into a production in general, A, B, always like turn it off. And if you miss it, then it's probably meant to be there. If you don't miss it, then it probably needs to go it probably just doesn't work in the context of the production but we get sometimes a bit distracted with constantly trying to add new things so if i go to the click module here you can see i've got an envelope where it just avoids clickiness too much and it's great because it gives you a visual representation where i can add length to this as well again you can see it's a bit beyond the envelope so you know getting too much longer than this isn't really relevant but then the starting point, I mean, that's about, what, 11.30. You can see if I move that a little bit, it gives you a different part of the waveform. So what I really like about that, it allows you to kind of shift around the vocal file or the vocal sample that you've found and be able to find little sweet spots as you go through that kind of work well with the decay of the sub. So I'm always playing around with this. And again, you've got a basic filter, which... When you move it to the right clockwise, it goes more towards a high pass. And again, more low pass if you move it more towards the left. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually play you, first of all, the actual raw file. So it's kind of like a pitch down type vocal type thing we've heard in a lot of tracks. But again, it's using that click in order to, as, as a click, in order to, if I just stop that. And if I just solo that. And it's just a very, very subtle thing. And if I turn that up and then just change the length or change the starting point, you can hear the feel of it and the tone of it kind of changes a little bit. And it can almost become like a kind of a, an overarching layer. And then adding in the next layer. These are like two sort of more traditional clicks from the internal collection within K2. 
kick too, which are, which are absolutely fantastic. And again, it's about shaping these clicks in a very definite direction, where, again, if I was to just roll off, you can hear it's more like a, a, you know, a more tonal sort of kick. And again, everything's come down by a couple of semitones here. And it's just a case of rolling that to make it blend nicely with the overall kick. And again, the click is very, very short, so the length can stay at 100%. And then more of a, you know, a chunkier kind of click. But again, it's all in the mix between the three layers. If I was to just drop that down a little bit. And then undo all the solos. And again, just rolling that down by a couple of semitones gives you an extra little kind of tone. And again, I can move to here so I can roll off maybe. Because sometimes what I find with kick two is that it can be a little bit aggressive in the sub end. It can be really, really quite powerful. So sometimes I'm having to back off just a little bit. And as fate would have it, the resonance on this kick happens to be 50 hertz. I didn't do that deliberately, I'm honest, honest. But yeah, good stuff. So yeah, just rolling off a few dB there, just to tighten it. What you'll find is, is that when you do this little dip, a lot of people think that you, you shouldn't touch kicks at that level or that range. I mean, I, I kind of disagree. What I've found generally is that when I use kicks in productions, if I do sort of do a little dip around 50, I'm constantly having to do this in mix downs and in mastering for, for, for artists. But even in production, if I just get a basic EQ8, anywhere around sort of 40 hertz, sometimes feels like sort of, you know, philosophically or intelligently at least, or intellectually that, oh, I might be rolling off too much low end. In fact, what happens is, is that it tightens the kick. It still does its job really well. And again, if you're making techno with a lot of like really, really big, sort of low end sounds, rumble, sub basses, things like that. What it allows you to do is sit that kick on top. A lot of people think that they should share the same frequencies and they really don't have to. You're actually creating a little bit of space and generating a lot of headroom in order to make that work pretty nicely. So again, I've got a choice here of two things. I could potentially just save this as a setting and be able to use it as a plugin within the production or I could go through the same process from before and then roll it into my resampling track and then sample it as a kick put it into a drum rack and have everything completely integrated into this overall kind of kit so what I tend to do is I'll put everything into the drum rack and actually push it to a point where everything sounds effectively finished ready for mix down Everything is processed, EQ'd, filtered correctly. Maybe effects are added as well. And effectively, it's a completely polished and finished rack, even with, even though I've got a basic kind of drum groove here, even with that, the whole groove gets saved into an overall drum rack. And I'll save from here, where essentially what I'll do is I'll take the entire channel, which means when you save it and drag it from here, it means that you take the MIDI, you take the channel strip, you take all of the effects. The entire state of that channel is saved. And it's actually an incredible time saver. And it's great if you've got an idea for a track because then you can just drag this whole drum rack and drop it straight in. And there has been instances where I've dragged and dropped a drum rack over a musical idea, hit play, and it's like, great, track done. I've done my drums in about 15 seconds. But that's the payoff of submitting to a process of sound design like this, where you almost, if you were to take the analogy of a painter, where a painter would normally have a palette where they're getting their colors right on the palette before they apply it to the canvas. This is the dance music production equivalent of this. You are getting the tools, your unique tools in your toolbox ready so when the inspiration comes, when you have the ideas for the tracks, you know exactly what tools to reach for at a moment's notice. And what it's doing is it's actually preserving the purity of your ideas. Because as you know, when you get an idea and that inspiration hits, 
the clock is ticking. And if it takes you 45 minutes to get to that point where you're ready to put that idea down, I find that by the time I get there, I've forgotten it. Or it doesn't quite get laid down in the same way. But if I can instantly grab the tools that I know that are going to express that idea because I've made time to create those tools in the first place, I'm creating more music, better music, and I'm far more motivated and inspired to finish tracks because they've started at a much higher level than they would have done if we start with just like a blank screen. This is my version of a lot of people use templates. I'm a bit of a, a weirdo, well, in general, <laughs> but uh, I'm also weird in the fact that I actually don't use templates and I actively try to avoid using templates at all times. The only template that I really use is the mix down template because I have my mix plugins in particular order and on particular channels and it's easier for me to drag and drop stems. That's the only template that I use. Everything else, it's a blank sheet of paper, but if we look down here, I have my library of sound. This is my toolbox. The sound of me as an artist lives in these folders. And this is something that I developed in conjunction with Sasha when I worked with Sasha a couple of years ago on his last album, where he wanted to be able to, say, for example, grab the drums from Expander and be able to drag and drop them in and be inspired at a moment's notice to write new music. So I helped to set that up for him. So every time he opens his laptop, he's got his legendary and iconic sounds at the touch of a button. So I then adapted that workflow in order to give myself the exact same hierarchy or the exact same toolbox of sounds. So I almost never start from, you know, blank presets or anything like that. I'm always starting from a point of something that I've already designed. So it just makes the process a lot more rich and authentic because I'm starting with my sounds. Sounds that are unique to me that nobody else has. That's how you get to sound like you rather than sounding like everybody else. And there's already, in my opinion, way too many people trying to sound like everybody else. That's the difference between, as Massimo Plex put it once, that's the difference between an artisan, somebody who can make something to order, and an artist who's doing their own thing. And I'd encourage you all to become artists because we need more of them and more people doing unique things in the industry. So that's the kick to kind of process. And what I, would, what I would do there is, again, I would probably do both. I would probably save the preset, save the channel strip, and then resample. Again, we're not going to do it now because it will just save time. And resample it and then put it into a drum rack and then that will get saved as well. Now, going back to track one for a second, we also have a pretty effective bass module. So if I was to just turn that off and turn this on, I'm almost using this. And you can see on the step sequencer here, just little transpositions of each step. It's really simple. You can just drag up and down. And then you can drag the velocity up and down. So what this will sound like now is if I was to stop all the clips and then just solo that. And what you've got there is just, again, it's almost like a little 808 kick within this bass module. And again, you can use different types of waves. You've got classic kind of like sawtooth and, you know, uh, pulse wave kind of waves. You've got, again, this type of super wave here, which can be quite, you know, modulated in a really nice way. You've got, again, FM here. And also modern is actually a wave table, which is quite cool. So you can get some really interesting kind of sounds out of that. And I'm just using it in a very simple configuration here in order to offset the kick. So even if I was to play both together, and even if I just turn the reverb off, It just gives a little bit of movement. And that's all it is. I mean, a lot of these sort of techno bass lines tend to be quite rolled down, transposed kicks of a more sort of subby variety. Now, if I was to use that in conjunction with the kick two kick rather than using the, the track one, again, 
what I would do here is I would use them as two separate modules, maybe in two separate instances to get separated outputs. It's just a little bit easier than rerouting it through Reactor. What I would do here is I would use, again, the kick. And again, there's a bit of an overlap there. Now, if I was to throw on this little tool, as I like to call it, the mother ducker, it's kind of like my own little Max for Live version of, say, LFO tool, Nicky Romero Kickstart. And all it is, it's so simple. It's a Shaper Max for Live plugin that will do, again, over a certain time frame, a certain rate, again, over quarters. It will just do volume automation because this Shaper, this envelope, can be mapped to, say, for example, eight or nine things. And I'm going to be giving this away soon on the NYT website. So obviously keep, keep it locked for an update on that. And all I'm doing here is I've got four little macros. And you can see it's, all it's doing is just modulating gain. Now, if I was to increase the depth, you'll see it just does an even higher amount of movement. And that's all it does to just give us that extra little bit of movement in the side chain. It's going to turn the offset up so we get a bit more volume there because it's starting to get a bit quiet. Unfortunately, due to the volume restriction in the room, by the sounds of it. And I also have the ability to change the stereo width. Now, this can be really, really useful for... Say, for example, if you're using this as a side chain on things like synth pads, lead sounds, vocals, reverbs, whatever... So that can be really, really useful. So I'm using this just to tighten a little bit. And again, the way the Shaper plugin works is the same as in Ableton. If I was to hold Alt, I can then change that envelope quite drastically. This is one of the reasons why I developed this, because I wanted something as simple and as quick as Nicky Romero, but I didn't quite want the plethora of options of, say, an LFO tool, which like sometimes you can just get lost in all the mod or modulations. And that's fantastic if you needed to do something really exotic. But if I just want to draw a curve in that works, then this thing's great, you know? And it's just something I come up with in five minutes just out of my own brain, essentially. So, yeah, you can use that as a nice little side chain. And again, if I want to, I can then just roll that all the way down to zero and I've effectively monoed the whole thing. So it's just using the utility, that Swiss Army Knife plugin, to the best of its ability. Simple, but very effective. And again, if you were so minded, it's probably something that you could build yourself in five minutes, to be honest with you. It's not rocket science. You know, it's cool. This is a, a nice little way of using Max for Live in Live 10 Suite. Now it's nicely integrated in as a whole piece of software. So just moving into other, other territory where bass is concerned... Uh, I've got this, again, this FM vibe, which, again, is just a very, very simple FM patch, but very effective, and, again, it'll turn into a bit of a conversation about reverb as well. i just turn that off a bit. And, you know, again, like, I don't think there's been a techno record made in the last five years without that sound, and, you know, it's on everything. You know, I, I come from a place where that sound was like, you know, the sound, basically, you know? Scouse house, as we used to call it. Socially acceptable donk, as techno is now. So, in terms of what I've got here, you've got an operator. And it's just doing the most simple FM thing you can think of. In its configuration, you've got operator B modulating the frequency of modulator A. And all it is is a four to one ratio. That's all it is. And this is something that you can actually build in any simple FM synthesizer. You could do it in FM8 quite easily. The same ratios result in the same kind of sound. And then obviously I've got the ability to transpose from there as well. And I've got the ability to lengthen the time as well. I've also got drive on an auto filter to thicken the sound. Again, if you've seen any of my master classes, you know, my one of my most used tricks is the MS2 filter mode with 3 dB of drive. And it is literally just the simplest thing imaginable. So if I was to, you know, turn the course up, you can get different tones. I 
and that four to one ratio is that real sweet spot. So to clarify, you're not actually hearing operator B. You're hearing its effect on A. That's how FM synthesis tends to work. And to be honest, FM is one of those types of synthesis that you'll probably spend the rest of your life learning about it. It's an incredibly deep, very, very you know, dense method of synthesis that can render results that no other type of synthesis can. It can be really, really, really effective. So just to close here, you can hear that reverb moving back here. Now, I tend to, I love using the, the built-in reverb, and a lot of people have seen my, my reverb in, in Ableton. So today I thought I'd show something slightly different. One of my favorite, probably my favorite reverb outside of the built-in reverb in Ableton for this type of thing is Eventide's Black Hole. And yeah, it, it's just, it's crazy. It's just the, one of the best, best reverb plugins you can think of. And again, just to give you a quick demonstration of that kind of, you can do it for, you can use it for the, the rumble, you can use it for this more sort of airy style, but you can go crazy with it as well, where if I turn the gravity down, and you can hear like the size moving quite a lot there. Now if I was to just take the reverb up a little bit here, Again, turn this up. And then I can do crazy things where I can just change the size of this thing. So you get different tones and that can be automated through a track. And again, really interesting feedback. Again, you have this touch strip at the bottom here. So say for example, if I was to move that to the right hand side, what you get is the ability to define a range between moving this strip from one side to the other, this sort of ribbon type thing. And then you can essentially say, right, well, I want that to be lower feedback here and then maybe more crazy feedback here. And you set ranges for multiple controls where say for example, it's a bit lower here and then it's a bit brighter here. So if we were to move from here, and then you can hit a kill button, which then cuts the reverb, essentially, and cuts the input, which is really, really super you know, useful for breaks and drops and stuff like that. So, Again, it kind of was starting to move beyond just kick and bass, but these are the elements within a techno production that tends to glue everything together. Those types of reverbs that multiple elements can use, kicks for the rumble, bass for that nice sort of overhang and that kind of epic scale. And again, it's good to think outside of the box. Again, the Eventide plugins tend to be quite expensive. However, they do do good sales. I mean, I picked this up for like 47 euros when it was on sale, like 50 euros, when it was on sale last year. And obviously we're getting into that time of year, Cyber Monday, plug-in madness, November, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, it's all good stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm a massive fan of, of Eventide and uh, some of these more exotic plugins that maybe a lot of people don't really think about using, but they're incredibly high quality. So yeah, have a look at Eventide, they're fantastic. So uh, I think my time is at an end. Any quick questions before we finish? Yes. The range frequency, how, how do you work? The, sorry? So you have the kick, you have the bass, uh -huh. the bass, how they behave in the frequency range? How do they behave in the frequency It depends per the track, obviously, because I'm working in different keys. In this case? In this case, I mean, essentially it's all in that, in that proper range of of a roundabout, again, you saw on the kick too, it was like the real resonant frequency of that kick, the major fundamental frequency was about 50 hertz. Normally for me, the resonant frequencies of my kicks tend to be between 50 and 55. So I'm always operating in that range. But again, the whole thing of sitting the kick on top of any sub or, or bass layers, that's the major principle. So you can actually, as long as you apply that principle, and the reason why I work this way, 
actually in a, in a main production, what I would do is I would start with the bass. And then what that gives me is the root key that I can then tune the rest of the drums, including the kick to. So it means the two of them sit very flush on top of one another. And then if there's any shared frequencies, I'll then roll them out of the kick. So they almost like, you can imagine, I always imagine a cake where it's like I'm sat, the, the kick's almost like a layer of jam on top of the, the, the sub, essentially. You know, they sit very, very tight together and they integrate because they're in the right key. And again, it's about transposing kicks and drums I don't necessarily get into the music theory of it. I tend to just go by ear and using a lot of different options until I get one that really locks. And it's unmistakable when you get that moment of like, it just you turn it down one semitone and it just locks in place and it feels good and it sounds great and everything just sounds like it's meant to be together. So that's how the integration works that way. Any other final quick questions? I'm hanging around, so you know, any questions, ask me afterwards. Other than that, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs>